So we're keeping up the momentum, and things are going to get a little bit spicy here. So our first panel is a head-to-head -head debate on AVSs versus ZK coprocessors. Um, AVSs have, you know, been one of the f novel ideas that have been coined by Eigenlayer um, and how they can essentially allow decentralized applications to benefit from the security and the flexibility of Ethereum um, versus coprocessors are kind of another design mechanism to enable applications to bypass a lot of the gas limitations. So both of them have very similar um, purposes to enable applications to just scale um, efficiently, but we'll be going head to head in understanding how, um, what the trade-offs are and what the design choices are. So I'm very excited to introduce um, Yuki from Fenbushi, who will be moderating, and our panelists, Ismail from Lagrange, Mo from Brevis, and Victor from Hashflow. Please give them a round of applause. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as uh, as uh, she has introduced, um, I'm Yuki. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be moderating this uh, hopefully uh, very interesting discussion slash spicy panel today. Uh, woo! 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 All right, so um, as you see the topics of the conversation today, AVS versus uh, uh, ZK Core Processor. Um, I think um, maybe to kind of like kick off uh, the, the conversation um, for maybe for both uh, um, Mo and then uh, uh, Victor, uh, especially, uh, oh, actually, no, all of you guys use ABS to some point, right? Yeah, we do. Okay, uh, Victor, you don't use ABS. We don't yet. Okay, so for Mo and uh, uh, Ismail, a question I have for you is, uh, why AVS for co-processing uh, co over ZK and vice versa? Can you make the case for ZK, ZK versus uh, AVS and some of the decision be uh, behind the, the usage of those? So for making an assertion over deterministic computation, the belief that we have is that ZK is fundamentally the correct tool set for that. That being said, while you can guarantee the safety of a computation through a ZK proof, you can't guarantee the liveness of that computation being served to an on-chain contract. So with what Lagrange focuses on in our intersection with Eigenlayer, it's very much a question of how do we use low cost of capital economic security in order to guarantee the liveness of our prover network that delivers ZK proofs for the purpose of our coprocessor. So for us, it's not a question of AVS versus ZK. It's a question of where is there an intersection between ZK and economic security that, as a composite, can deliver a far better experience to an end user? Mo? Uh, yeah, so for us, uh, we also don't see uh, this as AVS versus ZK. So for Brevis, we provide the ZK coprocessor capability in two different fashions. One is that you can use Brevis in a pure ZK model, where everything is computed in ZK when you have a smart contract having request and access historical data and do computation on them. Everything from end to end is computed in pure ZK. The second version that Brevis has is an optimistic version. So how the optimistic version works is that instead of everything being computed in ZK, you have this proposed plus challenge based model. In this proposed based challenge and, uh, and challenge based model, you have an optimistic proposer computing the result first and propose that as a uh, you know kind of a proposal on chain first to say that I'm claiming this is the actual correct result for coprocessing. And then there can be a latency of a challenge window opened. And during that challenge window, what you can do is you can generate a ZK Nasir proof if you think the initial proposal is incorrect. Now, how can you build a good proposer here? Uh, you can build this and you can use this as a centralized proposer, just like how optimistic rollup do. Like many of the optimistic rollup are also moving towards this optimistic proposer plus a ZK um, fraud proof architecture. The another way is to actually use an eigenlayer AVS or a, any sort of a proof of a, a stake or crypto economic security system to act as the proposer itself. It's sort of, uh, of mimicking the uh, uh, the uh, shared sequencer or kind of a proof of stake type sequencer that you see in many of the OP design as well. So, uh, you know, this way, the benefit of having this dual model is that uh, for many use cases, if you want to use pure ZK, you can of course do that. 
But if you want to use a lower cost solution, you can all use optimistic flow. And in addition, um, what this optimistic flow enables is something that many uh, pure, uh, uh, um, enables a bunch of features that pure ZK doesn't really support. For example, proof of completeness and proof of non-existence. So if you want to say you want to prove a user never interacted with Uniswap before, how do you want to do this in pure ZK? You need to literally prove the entire history of the user interaction on chain, and then you can sh show that, okay, among all these user, in user interactions, there is no such transaction between this user and Uniswap. But in this proposed plus challenge-based model, you can essentially say, okay, I'm claiming this is the case uh, that this user never interacts with Uniswap, and uh, the challenge, the ZK Nasir proof is actually much simpler because in that case, you just need to prove the user actually have one single transaction that is interacting between this user and the Uniswap. So, um, you know, this is why we're actually using EigenLayer as a, a uh, as kind of the proposer in the optimistic architecture and construct that we have. So, I think um, I, I see a bit of a, a dichotomy here because. Uh, one and I will dive into a bit more later uh, as well. But uh, uh, one one side on Lagrange where they're using AVS for liveness of the proven network, uh, and on the other hand for uh, um, for Mo on the on Brevis, uh, they're actually using uh, AVS for the proposers, uh, the optimistic uh, uh, zk proper. Um, now before we kind of like also get into b uh, get into that, I, I also want to kind of uh, take some. Um, perspective from uh, Victor on the, uh, from Hashwell. Now, um, for Hashwell, it's a bit uh, different because uh, uh, you guys are uh, building this uh, zk settlement layer um, that you know is attempting to also do uh, some corp uh, core processing work, zk core processing work. Um, maybe first of all, like if you can just elaborate a little bit on like what exactly those zk settlement layer does, and sure. second of all. Um, uh, maybe kind of share the reason why you chose uh, to use ZK core processing versus uh, the alternatives, uh, like as we discussed, AVS. Sure. Yeah, I want to start with the fact that um, I'm a big fan of AVS. I think it's I think it's great tech, and I think it's as as brilliant as it is simple um, to reason about. I, I think like the what we're building to start with is we've been thinking for for a long time about what does it take to build the the best exchange experience. Right, so we're in crypto. We're dealing with tokenized world, and exchanges are very, very important. And there's been like many attempts over the years, and you know we've had some in the past as well to build really, really good exchanges that give better guarantees than what we've seen in the past. And I think the the the, the general assumption here is that the best UX is already there, right? We already have um, really good, really performant exchanges built by Web two like tools. Um, like Binance that that do computation really really quickly with with state of the art CPUs and um, give traders exactly what they want and and one great example of that uh, of an exchange that had really really great features is FTX right and we all know what happened and maybe it's a little bit cringy to kind of keep mentioning it like two years after it happened but the reality is that how you know our ethos is more about getting that experience and kind of adding a little bit of spice to it so that users can feel more confident. And by creating examples of what can be done um, in terms of safety without compromising the performance, push for slightly uh, a slightly better world in terms of um, what exchanges do. So in our case, um, there were a lot of things to consider, but the most important thing was the modularization of the stack and the acknowledgement of the fact that people are already running exchanges, and those exchanges have different capabilities or on different chains. Um, and Assuming that those exchanges understand the crypto, crypto economic characteristics of those chains, right? So, from our perspective, the simplest way to share Ethereum's crypto economic security is by running a DApp, and that's been the case since the since the inception of the network. And obviously, you can't do everything by just running a DApp. So, therefore, Eigenlayer came 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 in, and they created this really really cool way to um, to run ADAP, AVS um, in terms of co-processing. Um, however, for us. We, we, we technically don't need that, and, and I'm going to expand a little bit. We don't need that because what we really need is to prove that every single liquidation occurred in a correct way, every single trade occurred in a correct way. Fees are transparent. Most importantly, um, fund transfers on-chain are legitimate. You can't just take people's money and invest them into weird things that you're not allowed to invest them in, right? So. What we want to do is modularize as much as possible and also give the flexibility to, to these developers as much as possible 
um, while proving computation, while allowing them to kind of decentralize at the, at the rate at which they would like to. Um, we also don't want to be um, forcing them to rely on the security on any particular chain, but mo most importantly, we want to allow them to, to prove the correctness of their computation. So the ZK proof in its most pure form satisfies our, our, our needs in terms of what we're looking to offer. Um, and it, it, you can think of this as what you need is to prove the computation. You make your data available to the extent to which you want to. Like obviously you can make it available through something that's AVS powered, like, like EigenDA. Um, and you need to, um, you need to um, pay for your compute, right? Which again, can be done via an AVS powered uh, system. So in a sense, we're just taking a very pragmatic approach on practicality and modularization. And we would be using AVS in a sense, what, if not you know, through the man at, at the actual core layer of the SDK, uh, but by leveraging things like um, EigenDA, potentially um, by um, allowing for AVS power networks to support proving. Um, so one one question I, I, I had is, are you a roll-up? We're, we're not a roll-up in a sense. We're trying to uh, cr uh, enable other people to create roll-up-esque um, okay, right. One very important thing is that we want to create a world in which current exchanges can migrate to this. So it, it's not just it's I not see. just new exchanges, right? Like we, we believe that you know everyone should aspire to be provable. Everyone should be should should be able to aspire to uh, provide like proof of reserve, proof of liabilities, proof of computation, and correctness to their users. Gotcha, gotcha. So basically, like you're uh, essentially creating a framework for other exchanges to Good. to use, and then. Correct. Yeah, okay. It's it's to be introduced later on this week as the Exchange OS. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. I see. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Because I think the the naming was a bit confusing, um, and you know there were some uh, thoughts around like, oh, is this a roll up? Was it not a roll up? So that clarifies. That clarifies. Um, and yeah. So kind of like also circling back here, um, as um, uh, Victor has alluded to the usage of EigenDA, uh, which is also a form of uh, uh, ABS. Uh, Lagrange, uh, as you mentioned, you're also using uh, AVS for the prover network for uh, liveness of yes. it, right? Um, and obviously, like prover network, um, Jeremy has mentioned as well. I, I, I know there are different variations of prover networks out there. Um, kind of curious, what's the reason that you uh, picked AVS as an option to uh, ensure liveness uh, in your case? Yeah, so at our core, Lagrange is a research company. We focus on developing novel proving systems and proof constructions that allow us to verify computation over authenticated data structures at a larger scale than has previously been possible in the blockchain space. So with our most recent benchmarks, we're able to prove generic SQL computation over about 1 million storage slots with a proving time of about a minute 20 seconds and asymptotically about 30 seconds. And so this is open source right now. You can go look at select queries that we're running over data sets of this size that we can prove is equivalent to, to on-chain state. So at our core, we, we focus on the scalability of coprocessing. But the question of how you achieve scalability in a production capacity is something that is an iterative question. And one of the things that you need to answer is how do you ensure you can have sufficient network participants who are contributing computation to, the comp to an overall proof that enables you to very efficiently deliver this proof back to on-chain users who've requested it. How do you ensure that if someone requires a price feed or they require a proof of user activity at block you know, B plus one, you can deliver it back to them within that SLA? In a centralized context, that's very simple, but obviously since we're building a decentralized application, since we build in, a, in an industry that prioritizes decentralization, the question is, how do you accomplish that without compromising the core liveness assumptions of the underlying protocols that rely on your proofs? And this is what we get from AVSs. We're able to statefully instantiate our prover network on top of Eigenlayer as one of the first ZK AVSs that has every single operator contribute computation to compute the proofs that users request wherein we effectively have a one event assumption on all of these participants. As long as there is an honest prover that exists within this network, we can guarantee that the proofs we deliver back to our users on chain are in fact um, generated by our network. So the reason that we do this in fact is because 
we're able to have a far better SLA for what we are able to offer our customers than alternative centralized solutions. Um, and when you say alternative centralized solutions, uh, can you kind of give some examples there? Yeah, so I think there's been a lot of conversations about co-processing in the abstract over the last year or so. And a lot of these questions get at how do we prove computation over, over the MPT tree? How do we prove that, for example, some historical storage slot had some value at some point in time? What these questions have not got at is how do we instantiate this in production in a way that actually can be beneficial to end user applications that want to leverage co-processing and they want to leverage the scalability that co-processing can offer without compromising the underlying set of security assumptions of that application. Where if you're a DeFi app on Ethereum and you are built on an execution space that has incredibly high security over state transitions, incredibly high liveness for your users, using a coprocessor that compromises any of those two things, wherein that might not necessarily have the same economic security as Ethereum or might not have the same liveness assumptions as Ethereum, is damaging and potentially a, a point of compromise to your end user. And so at our core, Lagrange prioritizes trying to offer a flavor of coprocessing that enables DeFi developers today to be able to benefit from increased scalability of the computation that their applications can leverage without fundamentally altering the core security assumptions of what they use. That's why we've taken a ZK-centric approach end-to-end. -end. That's why we focus on how do we deploy our, our proving system in a decentralized and, and in fault-tolerant way. And that's why we prioritize liveness when some other companies have historically not necessarily seen the value in it. Okay, I see. And then in case if there's a, and just to clarify, in case if there's yeah. any um, sort of like a prover uh, griefing uh, on, on not delivering the, the proof, um, then I presume that would be a slashable uh, penalties for the ABS. Is that correct? Yeah. So okay. one of the things that we often talk about in the AVS space, and I hope it's very clear the degree to which Lagrange is bullish on eigenlayering AVSs. We have two production AVSs. But one of the things we always explain to teams is that economic security is not free. There is cost of capital, irrespective of if you deploy on Eigenlayer, irrespective of if you deploy on, on Babylon, irrespective of if you deploy with your own native token. You have to incentivize people to stake their capital, and you have to pay a return that adjusts for the risk of that capital being slashed. If we look at DeFi markets, traditionally, the insurance premiums on uh, smart contract risk and governance attacks are approximately 4% to 5% plus, depending on the protocol's reputation. So we can deploy an eigenlayer, we can benefit from much lower cost of capital because the underlying asset is stable, but you still have to offset the risk that you create by being able to have the capacity to slash that capital in the event of fault. And so this is why Lagrange, at our core, we don't believe that prover networks need slashing. We can look at systems like Avalanche Snowman that have very high guarantees of liveness and don't have slashing at their core. Um, you're able to use the underlying cost of capital that's intrinsic to, to uh, the stake and you can sanction against rewards that would be paid to users who leverage this capital. And by doing that, you're able to never require a slashing condition on the underlying capital while still being able to guarantee that you can sanction against users who don't, in fact, compute a proof on time. To put that very concretely, if the risk-free rate's 2% and you have a billion dollars staked and I restrict your reward for a week, effectively, I can, I can sanction you against about $400,000 in rewards that would otherwise be paid out to your, to your stakers. I see. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I think uh, one of the things that um, I also want to touch upon is, um, as uh, Ismail have kind of alluded to, uh, the cost of using ABS versus the cost of running uh, purely on ZK, um, which is kind of relevant for uh, Brevis as well, because since um, you are kind of doing both options or enabling both options, um, with the optimistic uh, ZK for all proof approach, um, you will still have proposals who are um, basically have some economic securities right. uh, secured by ABS. Uh, I, b I believe it's ABS, right? Yeah. Um, and then, um, but but then you obviously have some uh, additional cost that is associated with them, them you know, uh, up 
up up front in the capital to make sure that the proposal is behaving uh, honestly, which Absolutely. would come to the cost uh, uh, to the users or the network itself or, yep. or the previous network itself. Mm -hmm. um, in the meanwhile, on the ZK side, there's not any like upfront cost because it's just uh, provers running the proofs and generating the proofs. Now, obviously, that can be considered a cost the, yes. in 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 a different ways, right? So, how do you kind of like see like you have a cost of upfronting the capital and you have a cost of running those prover computations? Mm -hmm. how, how what's the kind of trade trade off space that you that you're uh, kind of uh, designing around here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great question, right? So like, you know, what uh, what we do at Brevis is we try to open up the trade-off play, uh, trade-off plane as wide as possible, so that developers can choose the operating point they uh, prefer and uh, that is optimal for them uh, for their applications, right? So you know, uh, for example, we have the support for pure zk. If you want to do this everything in zk computation, we have extremely scalable system. You can do millions of uh, uh, transaction query and get millions of transactions uh, uh, data and uh, generate the computation proof on that easily, uh, you know, under uh, a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, but you can also uh, have the option to use this optimistic plastic model. Now, that part is where the trade-off dial can be tuned. So there are multiple dials you can tune there. Uh, the first is that you can tune the dial all the way to the very left end where you just have a single proposal. You or uh, th the application operator themselves can be a single proposer to generate the co-processing result if you want. And the trade-off for that is that you sort of need to wait a pretty long time to say, okay, uh, now because I, as a single guy, is generating the proof, uh, is generating the co-processor proposal, the initial proposal, and I want to wait a sufficient long, uh, long time period so that the challenger can initiate a challenge and submit a ZK initial proof if needed. Because remember in our optimistic model, the ZK proof is the last line of defense. And you know what some other developers might want to do is that, okay, so we want to basically have some liveness guarantee at least for this optimistic model. So what they can tune is you can tune the kind of a knob a bit, ba uh, a, a, a bit towards the middle to say, that, okay, what we want is we want a decentralized system that is submitting the proposal for me but I'm not necessarily want to ch slash and challenge and uh, kind of a basically kill the stakes for these uh, uh, proposers. And you can do that too. Um, you know, uh, right now in Eigenlayer, they, they doesn't have slashing enabled yet, but in our design, that once they have slashing, there will be two options to either kick out the uh, validator or kick out the node operator without actually slashing the, the delegated stake or slash them. So in the middle kind of a uh, knob, you can actually pay a bit more to the liveness you're getting from this. And uh, in, this, in the final model, where you're more trusting and uh, relying on the crypto economic security, you can dial the knob all the way to the left, uh, all the way to the right, and saying that, okay, now I want to wait just a very, very short period of time for many use cases, and directly use that result in the smart contract without actually waiting for the full necessary period for initiating the ZK challenge. But I want to still have the capability to have a very, very high level of default security uh, proof of stake and the crypto economics level. This is where you need to dial the knob so that when once the challenge is success successful, you actually need to slash those node operators. So that means that uh, you as a, a developer and application need to pay for that cost. And uh, you know, um, I think uh, Eigenlayer is very interesting for us because it opens up a very, very interesting way to design your staking stack in a modular fashion so that you can actually mix and match different uh, flavors of uh, how you use this uh, stake and restaking security in different ways. And this is uh, how, why we're uh, basically pro uh, providing this very wide landscape and trade-off plane for the developers, for them to choose uh, for their best uh, yeah, use cases. Whether some of the mm -hmm. operating points will actually diminish over time, we don't know. Uh, but you know, we will definitely open this up for the developers, for them to flexibly choose. Um, one thing I, I, I want to dig in a little bit here is that uh, because you have like these two different modes, let's say let's yep. say let's say we, we take the optimistic uh, uh, approach first. Um, because it's optimistic and that the actual uh, verification of it uh, may take some time, right? Um, doesn't that restrict the scope of type of application that you can build with that kind of core processors? Versus absolutely, absolutely. So like yeah. this is why we have both models. Right, so you know, for the optimistic model, the latency is something you need to live with, 
right? So because you, if you want to uh, still have the last line of defense in ZK security, then there has to be a sufficient time to detect the potential fault of the initial proposer. This is similar to an optimistic rollup, but the good thing is that it, it's actually better than optimistic rollup because most of the ZK coprocessor computing are stateless. Uh, so instead of uh, um, you know having the potential to go back all the way to the block history to generate the, the entire block execution history using data availability like optimistic rollup, you can actually just look at the computation itself as a unit and generate what is uh, and detect whether the the initial proposal is actually faulty or not. So in practice, the challenge period, even just in the most simplistic optimistic model with a centralized proposer, can be much shorter uh, than you know an optimistic rollup. Gotcha. Um, I think another question uh, to everyone here um, is around the usage of AVS in the future. Um, so obviously, you know. You guys may be using AVS in different ways. Uh, Victor using flag and DA uh, AVS itself, Ismail for liveness of the proof of network, and then so uh, security of the proposer's um, be behavior. Um, for each different cases uh, that we're talking about here, do you see AVS as mm, some sort of like a temporary bandage to the current compute latency and, uh, and the cost issues surrounding uh, ZK? Um, would you think that the need for AVS may, uh, let's say, change over time as the compute landscape changes? Let's say if we get a broader adoption of ASICs and, and, and things become like trivially cheap, like it, it, it becomes like much cheaper to, let's say, uh, aggregate signatures and then prove that uh, and settle that on, 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 on Ethereum. Uh, to the point that actually maybe you don't even need uh, some sort of additional trust layers to secure uh, eigen DA type of instances, for example. For example, um, do you think that could be a possible future? Would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? Curious to hear your thoughts. Should I go first? Um, you can go first. I, I, I definitely don't think AVS are going to go away. I mean, the, the parallel I want to draw is like every single time uh, someone creates a new programming language, there's going to be like another few years until someone else is going to create the next great programming language. Um, I think what, what we're really developing here is a set of tools, right? And these tools come with different guarantees. Um, and there's like par parts of it is, is mathematics, like just like pure zero knowledge cryptography, which is, which is great. And it's kind of like used by pretty much everyone here today. Um, and the other part of it is like, incentives and economics, the way you pay for things, the way you incentivize people, like, you know, how you bootstrap projects, right? Like, how do you how do you actually get there? And you also have applications that need different guarantees and different types of user experience and different types of properties like liveness and, and, and uh, of sorts, right? So, yes, ASICs are, are going to be amazing, right? Like, it's it's kind of like FPGAs, right, for, for financial um, software. And they're going to help us, like, make everything cheaper, which in turn is going to make these tools that we're building uh, that we're using much much better. I don't think the AVS um, idea is going to get um, uh, is is, is going to get deprecated by 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 cheaper ZK for for many reasons that have been talked about today as well. So that's at least my my take here. So to start with a, a very unambiguous statement, economic security is not going anywhere in crypto, or, nor is crypto economic security for that matter. Um, that being said. The use of economic security for deterministic compute is something that I don't think we're going to see as prevalently in the future. We're going to see economic security as a highly relevant primitive for um, securing against retroactively observable faults that are not deterministic at the point of execution. An example of that's liveness. Intersubjective. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so retroactively observable. And so to make that very Clear, so if I was to commit that I was gonna compute a proof for you by time t, I can't prove for you a priori that I'm gonna compute that proof for you by time t until I generate that proof. But if I don't compute that proof for you by time t, you can prove retroactively and deterministically that I have missed my computation. And so things like this are what economic security for the duration in crypto will be highly relevant for that being said, the use of economic security to attest to some computation that one plus one equals two is not going to be something that we see for the foreseeable future. As ZK compute gets easier, 
we can shift the imperative away from using economic security for everything in crypto, and we can shift it to using it to secure against faults that can be proven ex post. For things that, like what Lagrange does, proving compute over blockchain state, there isn't necessarily a reason as systems get more performant to use economic security for that. You can simply generate a proof and verify that proof in the execution space that you want to leverage that scalability solution in. But to use something like economic compute for liveness is, is something that Lagrange will continue to do, and I assume most companies in the space will continue to do. So I, I would caution people against over-indexing now on using systems that use attestations to, to simple deterministic computations, because a lot of these things have very high cost of capital, very poor monetary policy, and we'll have the down-only curves we've seen from all of the tokens that have tried to subsidize this, this, this paradigm in the last two cycles. ZK is going to be a big unlock in that space, and it's going to make the monetary policy of a lot of these systems a lot stronger as well. What do you think, Mo? Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, how ABS and the crypto economic security uh, model is going to uh, interact with ZK is definitely going to evolve over time. Uh, right now, uh, if you look at, if we look at ZK off-chain verifiable computing in general, um, the l kind of computation that you can do on pure ZK is already a lot. Uh, but there are actually some caps or some upper limit that we, ca we are touching on right now. So for example, um, you know, Modulus Lab did this, uh, you know, great blog post that basically generating an inference based on a large language model for just one word. It takes the 96 hours to just generate that one single word inference uh, using pure uh, ZK. So, you know, these type of computation for foreseeable future, if we want to bring them to the blockchain and at the same security level of um, you know, using just pure ZK. An optimistic model uh, like what we are thinking and architecting here makes a lot of sense. Basically, you can have a proposal saying that uh, this is the LLM uh, inference model, uh, generate the result, and if the result is incorrect, only then you actually incur the large cost uh, of using ZK computing. So, you know, specifically for AI, uh, there are also some alternative uh, discussion about using optimistic challenge, like true bit fashion optimistic challenge. Uh, but even uh, for, for this type of very heavy computation load, uh, you know, uh, type of tasks, using true bit like uh, interactive challenge is actually super expensive because the computation itself of a very large model inference need to be broken down on chain with multiple steps and with very, very large input data on the protocol parameters, on the protocol input weights, and all that, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, in the in the type of computation loads like AI inference, uh, this is something that uh, zk right now cannot handle. And uh, you know, and if we want to actually utilize that uh, type of computation on chain uh, using an optimistic uh, uh, proposal plus challenge based model is something we feel makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I think. Um, just to kind of like, um, from my perspective, like what I see, um, I feel like the there are a lot of like underlying context uh, uh, when we discuss about a lot of ABS and ZK uh, that we perhaps uh, may need to dive into further. If obviously we don't have time today, but uh, is around like the use cases uh, for which we are talking about for for ZK co processors. Uh, because depending on the use cases, as uh, Moda mentioned, like there are some some ML stuff that is uh, inference that takes uh, way too much compute for for ZK to to efficiently uh, uh, compute uh, right now. Um, but then there are other ones that um, you know, well maybe just uh, purely uh, uh, data SQL type of things that uh, uh, can be done more efficiently. So just to kind of like uh, round a, a lot of the conversation here and and so hopefully end it in a bit of a light note. Um, what what are the most exciting uh, sort of like um, I guess what are your favorite slash exciting use cases uh, that you are foreseeing with the uh, uh, zk core processing stack that you're building um, in general in general? Yeah. yeah, I have to make a shameless plug here. We shot an episode with of a new series with Gajesh from Eigenlayer. Mo was was there as well. That's coming out shortly after ETHCC, where we go into a lot of detail on some exciting ZK coprocessor use cases, despite the fact that Lagrange and Brevis are competitive. You know, professionally, I think we've been very collaborative within the eigenlayer space, which has really been a credit to, 
to Eigenlayer as well as to to Mo and to the Brevis team as well as to Lagrange team as well. And so, you know, one of the the things that I think a lot of the zk coprocessor use cases boil down to is how can we customize some on-chain experience based on a proof of the u a user's previous activity with that protocol. And so you can think of this as discounts in DeFi, live ops in GameFi, uh, rebates for, for uh, GambleFi applications. And you can think of anything that requires awareness of a user's prior activity with your smart contract. You know, we're, we're very used to thinking of smart contracts as, as stateless when it comes to their awareness of a user's prior behavior. I can't figure out who are my power users on chain. I can't offer a discount programmatically from my smart contract. I can't offer you know, swap rebates to LPs. So with coprocessing, a lot of these use cases very quickly become unlocked and smart contracts can become much, much more scalable. You know, we typically talk about scalability of blockchains as you know, new execution spaces, new horizontal scalability through rollups, but we don't often talk about how do we take the existing execution spaces that we have, the existing applications that we have, and make them intrinsically more scalable through giving them access to new types of compute. And you know, the, another great use case is a lot of these dynamic and exciting DeFi primitives, things like real volatility on chain, trustless TWAPs. You know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, about the cost of insuring a lot of these, these smart contracts, if you look at like Nexus, and one of the things that you have to often insure against is compromising oracles or, or, or compromising any type of core off-chain logic that these things rely on. As we move to more trustless systems, the inherent risks that developers face in the space and the, the required yield that has to be paid to a lot of these DeFi applications will become much more normalized. Mo? Well, you know, as Ismail mentioned, I definitely watch out uh, for the release of uh, the uh, episode that we did with Agajash uh, from uh, Eigenlayer. And, uh, you know, uh, just to add on a, uh, a few more use cases uh, more concretely, there are a lot of use, use cases that we're excited about, but uh, it's very hard to pick which one is actually the favorite. And, uh, you know, the capability to access the historical user behavior is very, very important. Uh, another very concrete use case that uh, I think is pretty exciting is this type of uh, new type of airdrop and incentive alignment programs that you can run uh, for your protocol. Right, so uh, in DeFi summer, what happened was that everything is super transparent. You have a fixed amount of a reward, and that's the uh, transparent reward amount for everyone to access, and this is a liquidity you can buy directly. Uh, in today, recently, the airdrop uh, paradigm is very, very opaque. It's very hard to tell who gets how much airdrop, and once airdrop happens, it's done. Basically, you see, you, you, we often see liquidity just leave the ecosystem, the users stop using the protocol, and the everything's done. So I think using ZK coprocessor, you can actually achieve a sweet spot in the middle to have some sort of opaqueness, but at the same time, having the capability to continue incentivize the user on an ongoing basis, even after the initial airdrop allocation is done. Right, so it can be implemented as the initial airdrop only drops a cap of token or the max amount of token a user can, uh, can get, but instead of uh, continuously just like initially, uh, continuously just dropping and issuing token to end users, which create a lot of compliance issues, you can actually use the code processor to say, I'm gonna evaluate each of my community pa participants uh, behavior and activity against the whole baseline of the entire ecosystem's uh, activity on an ongoing basis and generate new type of incentive mechanisms uh, based on that. So this is something not exactly kind of a, a retrospective examination of user behavior, but rather kind of an ongoing analysis basis, uh, which can be pretty exciting. And uh, you know, uh, not only on the user-facing side and uh, kind of a mass adoption side, there are a lot of interesting things you can build on the infrastructure side with coprocessor as well. So uh, you know, Brevis and many other coprocessor is uh, cross-chain in nature. So basically what it means is that it allows you to access Ethereum state or many other chain states uh, from a different chain. So uh, how to build that is basically there is one way or another to relay block headers or to essentially generate a proof or a test station of block headers on Ethereum on other blockchains. Once you have the block header, you have everything. And uh, this is how you can access many states uh, in Ethereum directly. You can build a novel type of uh, cross-chain oracles 
where if you are an application-based chain or a role up a service chain, you can easily access some very powerful and very secure Oracle data from Ethereum as well. So uh, yeah, these are a couple of examples that I can uh, think of right now. But yeah. Uh, oh, we're, we're short on time, but um, just yeah. just just real quick here. Um, since since um, you know we, I'm talking about exchanges, I'm very very excited for the bit midterm more so than the long term. I know long term we're uh, converging to correct uh, technologies. I really want to see this kind of like these technologies being brought from academia to the streets. So I really want to see some of these use cases being used by people who are not on chain natives or people who actually care about using products um, by like more than just like. A thousand people, ten thousand people, but really hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So, uh, at least like that's what we're trying to bring into exchange. So we're trying to make a, create a world where like at least people who have no idea of how the blockchain works, how like security works, uh, are going to be using these. And I think it's these people that are going to be pushing companies going forward to actually adopt these technologies because they're going to be using it without even knowing it, without even having to get the education to do it. So, all right. Um, you have anything? Yeah, I guess the last thing I want to call out is I, I, I really caution people to bet again to not bet against the state of the art. I mean the rate that we see ZK solutions improving is 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 hard to appreciate. And so betting that a a use of, of economic security to attest to deterministic compute is the future, I would really caution developers against that. The, the value of ZK is that you can remove the trust requirements on some uh, set of off-chain actors, and this is what we think is the future of the space. And the good thing is that if you're using Brevis, you don't need to bet on anything. You can just write one set of code and can be used in both models. Well, I mean, we obviously see the d two sides of the arguments here. Um, I think... Um, I think that's uh, it for today. We don't have a lot of time left, but uh, uh, you know, feel free to uh, maybe after the conversation go ask uh, each speakers of, the, of how their stack works and maybe you know uh, build on top of them uh, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, uh, round of applause for the speakers coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you.